Thank you. That concludes general questions. And before we move to First Minister's questions, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery Ahod Alhaj Murad Balawag Ibrahim, Chief Minister of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindano. The next item of business is First Minister's questions, and at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The SNP ferry scandal has damaged our nation's reputation for shipbuilding excellence mm -hmm. and has left islanders without vital transport links they need for their everyday lives. This week, Audit Scotland said this, the costs to complete the ferries have continued to escalate. The total cost to taxpayers because of SNP incompetence is now £338 million, pounds, three and a half times more than the original contract of £97 million, pounds, and there is still no completion date for the ferries. But Ferguson Marine, fully owned by the SNP government, has paid out bonuses of £87,000 to highly paid chiefs. So very simply, First Minister. What were these bonuses for? Yeah. First Minister. Presenting officer, uh, before I answer uh, these questions, let me remind the Chamber that the Deputy First Minister will make a statement to Parliament this afternoon uh, on these issues and will provide uh, updates in respect of some of these issues. Um, two, two issues. Uh, in response to Douglas Ross's question. Uh, firstly, in respect of the Audit Scotland Section 22 report that was published on Tuesday, we welcome uh, that report and certainly acknowledge the legitimate issues uh, that were raised in it. And as I said, the Deputy First Minister will provide uh, the update requested by the Auditor General uh, this afternoon. Uh, that report is critical of the payment uh, of bonuses to senior staff uh, at the Yard in the financial year. 2021-22 um, and the process by which these uh, payments were arrived at. Uh, we accept that criticism and can assure Parliament that new arrangements uh, have been put in place indeed at the Deputy First Minister's request to ensure uh, that that does not arise in the future. Uh, the second point from me is in relation uh, to the construction of the ferries. I have said many times and I say again uh, we deeply regret uh, the delays to uh, the completion of the ferries and the cost overruns. Uh, the uh, management at the yard uh, has, uh, of course, made assessments of the cost of completing uh, the ferries and Scottish Government officials are applying uh, robust scrutiny to that. But again, the Deputy First Minister will be able to give a further update to Parliament this afternoon. Douglas Ross. I'm sorry, our standing orders of this Parliament are very clear. If a minister is aware of information that they can provide to Parliament, they should do so. It's not acceptable for the First Minister to say, tune in and a couple of hours' time. This is First Minister's questions. As the Leader of the Opposition here in Holyrood, I am asking about an issue that she must be aware of. So I will ask again, what were these bonuses for? £87,000 of taxpayers' money, as the Deputy First Minister whispers in her ear. I hope he has the answer for the First Minister to give this chamber at First Minister's question. Because the Auditor-General is clear that these bonuses were unacceptable his words. We think they are downright scandalous. It is indefensible. It is a bonus for failure. And this failure is all on the SNP government. This is a company owned by ministers. They are ultimately in charge of it. So will the SNP government and the First Minister intervene now and demand these bogus bonuses are returned to the taxpayer? First Minister. Well, Presiding officer, I, I, I'm aware Douglas Ross uh, is, is really interested in listening to the answers to questions, but I, I am answering the questions in relation, in relation to the bonuses. Uh, Audit Scotland uh, issued, issued a Section 22 report that was published on Tuesday, and in that report, uh, the Auditor General is clear uh, that the governance involved in the process that led to these payments uh, was deficient. In other words, it is not possible to be clear about the basis of these bonus payments, uh, these performance Excuse payments. me, First Minister. That Excuse is me, why First Minister. Sorry. We will hear one another in this chamber at all times with courtesy and respect. Regardless of who is speaking in the chamber, I expect all members 
to do the courtesy of listening. Thank you. That indeed is why uh, changes have been put in place, new arrangements have been put in place uh, to ensure that a situation like this does not arise again. Of course, there has been changes in the management uh, at the shipyard uh, since the, the financial year in which these bonuses uh, were paid. Uh, so we take seriously and respond uh, in full uh, to the views uh, in the Section 22 report published by the Auditor General. Uh, more generally, as I went on to say, uh, focus continues continues to be on ensuring the completion of the ferries and that the Scottish Government applies robust scrutiny uh, to all cost assessments uh, that are issued uh, by the shipyard. Douglas Ross. Really? Really? The Scottish Government uh, you know, ensures that they look at all the costs paid by the shipyard. So why can the First Minister not just stand up and tell me, asking the question, and people here in the Chamber and people across Scotland what was done by the fat cats to deserve £87,000 of bonuses? It's a very simple question. Audit Scotland said this week it is not clear how the performance was assessed, nor were appropriate frameworks and governments in place. These bonuses for failure should not have been allowed, and the First Minister should be able to tell the people of Scotland what they were paid for. And she went on to say there are changes so the situation does not arise again. But today, today, there are reports that the current Chief Executive of Ferguson Marine can get an £82,000 bonus every year, and his contract has no criteria for measuring performance. So once again, Nicola Sturgeon and this government is putting eye-watering sums of public money in jeopardy to be paid to ferry bosses for failure. So, First Minister, why are fat cat bosses getting a single, ferry, a single penny before a ferry has been finished? First Minister. The issue identified uh, by Audit Scotland is that the process involved in the payment of these uh, bonuses was deficient and therefore there is not sufficient clarity of the basis in which they were paid. Uh, that is the issue uh, that was identified and the issue uh, that we are seeking to address so that a situation like this uh, cannot arise in the future. Um, and uh, that is the position I have set out and I'm setting it out clearly and of course the Deputy First Minister will make a further statement to Parliament uh, later on uh, where others uh, can question him on that as well. And we remain focused in supporting the shipyard to complete uh, the ferries as quickly as possible. Um, I have said many times before, and I will no doubt say uh, many times again, uh, the delays and the cost overruns are deeply regrettable. But I come back to a point I've also made uh, many times again. Uh, we have always been determined to secure the future of that shipyard in order that it can deliver these ferries and have a future uh, that allows those employed at the shipyard to continue to be employed there. Uh, so yes, uh, there have been uh, regrettable failings here, uh, which of course the government is accountable for, uh, but we remain focused on addressing these and we will continue to do it uh, with that determination and focus. Douglas Ross. I, I think it's incredible that the First Minister just accepts us all to, to be happy that a mistake has happened. We don't know why this money has been paid out, but it is £87 £1,000 of taxpayers' money going into a project that is already three and a half times over budget. I'm not sure what John Swinney is going to pull out of the hat this afternoon, but if it's the same answers, people of Scotland will demand more, because this is our taxpayers' money that is being wasted with no accountability from Nicola Sturgeon or the SNP. So on top of £87,000 of bonuses for failure, CMAL, the ferry agency, has spent almost £100,000 on a PR firm. What a waste of money. No one can put positive spin on this disaster. Speaking this week, Audit Scotland, in their report, said this. There is still no certainty over how much the ferries will cost, when they will be ready, or whether the shipyard has a viable future. Those are the words of the Auditor General. So as Nicola Sturgeon prepares to sail off into retirement and considers her own legacy, she should reflect on the fact that these ferries have been in construction throughout her time in office and they remain rusting hulks and the islanders who rely on them remain without these vital links. So can the people of Scotland get a straight, honest answer from the First Minister for once? 
When will these ferries be ready, and how much will the total cost be? First Minister. Well, firstly, going back to the very beginning of that question, um, if I've learned one thing uh, over uh, recent times in this job, it's never to expect Douglas Ross to be happy uh, about anything. So uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm sure, not sure that is going to, to change. In, in terms of uh, the detail of the questions, of course, uh, the estimates for cost uh, and delivery of the ferries are in the public domain. Uh, they will be updated as appropriate. The Deputy First Minister will give a further update to Parliament uh, later this afternoon. Uh, but of course, uh, Ferguson's have continued uh, to progress uh, with the building uh, of the ferries. Uh, for example, uh, the MV Glen Sanock successfully uh, completed uh, a dry docking period at the start of this month. Uh, so these milestones uh, continue, continue to, to be delivered. Um, I am of the view that the failures here uh, are unacceptable. I deeply regret these failures, uh, but that is why it is important uh, that we continue to focus on delivering these ferries um, and also securing a long-term future uh, for the shipyard. In terms of the Auditor General's comments about viability, of course, all uh, businesses have to secure long-term viability. The Yard is working to secure uh, commercial opportunities and has uh, already been successful in securing some commercial opportunities. And that, of course, is part of our priority, to make sure the ferries are completed, but then, of course, uh, to make sure that Ferguson Shipyard it has uh, a long and secure future and continues to employ those whose jobs depend on it. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. President Officer, yesterday's Tory budget demonstrated whose side they are on. A budget that gave tax breaks to the wealthiest and did nothing to help those most in need. We need a mini meaningful windfall tax now to scrap the non-DOM status and to invest in our communities across the country. That is not possible with this Tory government. And while the Tories do little to address the cost of living crisis across the UK, we have a Scottish government not doing enough to address the NHS crisis here in Scotland. And one key part of our NHS is dentistry. So can the First Minister tell the Chamber what proportion of dental practices are now refusing to take new NHS patients? First Minister. Um, I don't have that uh, figure immediately to hand. I can provide it. Uh, but what I uh, do know is that over 1.6 uh, million NHS examination appointments were completed between April and uh, October, with an average of more than 300,000 courses of treatment uh, Per month, meaning I think we're on course for over three and a half million uh, contacts uh, over the course of this financial year. Uh, clearly, there are pressures on NHS dentistry, uh, as there are pressures on all parts of the National Health Service, and we continue to support the dentistry profession as we continue to support the NHS as a whole. Anna Sarwar. Prime Officer, I should have declared an interest, of course, that my wife and I are both qualified dentists. Uh, and Nicola Sturgeon may not know this, but I do, and my wife does, that actually you're meant to get a dental checkup every six months uh, if you're a citizen across the country. So those figures aren't good enough. And data obtained through Freedom of Information request shows that just one in five dental practices are taking on new patients. One in five. And in four health boards in areas in Scotland, zero practices are taking on new NHS patients. Zero. And we know who suffers when dentistry is cut back. Children, the most deprived, and families forced to go private. Almost one in ten children have severe decay or an abscess up significantly since 2020. And in fact, dental extractions under general anaesthetic are the most common reason for children to be admitted to hospital. I've worked in our NHS. I was a dentist in Paisley, and I saw firsthand the impact of this government's failures on the poorest communities in our country. So surely the First Minister knows, as I know and NHS staff across the country know, that this Health Secretary is incompetent and out of his depth. First Minister. NHS dentistry, of course, is under pressure. All parts of the NHS are under pressure. Uh, I won't repeat uh, the statistics uh, I gave in my first answer, but we have uh, worked to incentivise NHS dentistry. We're in the course, of course, of abolishing dental charges, starting uh, with young people, and I'll come back to uh, youngest people uh, and dental health in a moment. Uh, but if you look at uh, some other statistics and comparisons, we have in Scotland 57 uh, dentists per 100,000 of our population providing NHS dental services. That compares with just 43 
per 100,000 uh, south of the border. 50.4% uh, of adult patients were seen by an NHS dentist in the last 24 months, 50.4% compared to just 38.2% uh, in England. And of course, the latest figures show that over 95% of the Scottish population are registered with an NHS dentist. Uh, just over a third of adults and less than half of children, compared to that 95% in Scotland, have access to an NHS dentist in England. So yes, under pressure, but a solid uh, foundation uh, there. Uh, finally, in terms of child oral health, in recent years uh, we have seen very significant improvements in child oral health in Scotland. So the first year of the National Dental Inspection Programme in 2002, uh, Anna Sarwar should be aware of this, showed that 45% of primary one children had no obvious uh, decay experience. Uh, in 2021-22, that figure had increased from 45% with no obvious uh, decay to 73%. That's the improvement we're seeing in child oral health. So yes, there are challenges, but we continue to support the dental profession to meet those challenges head on. Anna Sarwar. Look, I, I welcome free dentistry, but you need dentists in order to get the treatment across Scotland. And the First Minister is clearly not listening to the profession. But now, rather than confronting the NHS crisis, we have an SNP talking to themselves about themselves. In fact, it seems the only things missing from this SNP leadership election is an Ash Regan press conference outside the Four Seasons, uh, or maybe a Saltar waving Stop the Seal uh, rally by Kate Forbes outside Holyrood. And meanwhile, the machine candidate, the incompetent Hamza Youssef, is presiding over chaos in Scotland's NHS. This morning, we heard a mother on BBC Radio Scotland saying her son, who is about to start school, has never seen a dentist despite years of trying. Never seen a dentist. And he will be one of many. And the British Dental Association have told us the number of dentists in our communities has fallen despite what Nicola Sturgeon claims. And they also tell us 59% of Scottish dentists have reduced the amount of NHS work since lockdown and 83% of dentists plan to reduce NHS services further in the year ahead. In their words, it is very clear an exodus is in motion. The Health Secretary has lost the confidence of dentists and patients. He has lost the confidence of the SNP Finance Secretary. Surely even Nicola Sturgeon can see that Scotland has no confidence in him and he's not up to the top job. First Minister. Well, ultimately, of course, it's the Scottish people uh, who will make these judgments, and the record of uh, past years is one, is one that, uh, thank you, that I uh, know terrifies uh, Anna Sarwar. Uh, but come back to NHS dentistry, because Anna Sarwar rightly talks about the importance of access to NHS dentistry. So let me just uh, repeat the, the figures showing the reality. Elsewhere in the UK, just over a third of adults and less than half of children have access to an NHS dentist. That's the position in England. In Scotland, the figure is more than 95%. 95% of our population are registered with an NHS dentist. That's access to dentistry. We've got more dentists per head of population than other parts of the UK, and significant progress has been made on improving child oral health. So yes, there are pressures. Yes, there are challenges, uh, but these statistics show that we are meeting those challenges uh, and we will continue to do so. Question number three, Ariane Burgess. To ask the First Minister ahead of the publication of the next report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change next week what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that Scotland plays a leading role in tackling the global climate emergency. First Minister. I look forward to the publication of the next IPCC report. I certainly hope it leads to accelerated action to tackle the climate emergency on a global scale. Uh, the Scottish Government is, and it's important that it continues to take action, both here at home, but also working to support the global effort uh, to tackle climate change. Uh, earlier this week, I chaired a Cabinet subcommittee uh, focused on, firstly, our response to the recent uh, Committee on Climate Change report, and also looking at progress towards the update of our Climate Change Action Plan. Ariane Burgess. 
I thank the First Minister for her answer. Scotland's history of heavy industry means that we have a significant responsibility to tackle climate change, the greatest challenge we face this century. We've also shown how we can lead from the front in transforming energy supply to clean, green, renewable future. So does the First Minister agree with me that this decade is one of crucial choices, for example, on standards of homes and buildings, on transport patterns, on what we farm and how we use land, and that it is those areas that our future lies in, not squeezing more fossil fuels out of new oil fields like Rosebank and Jackdaw? First Minister. Um, yes, I do agree that this decade is a critical one uh, if the world is to avert what will otherwise be the catastrophic impacts uh, of climate change. Indeed, uh, the issues uh, that the member highlights, uh, for example, how we decarbonise the heating of our homes, uh, decarbonise further decarbonise transport, uh, were exactly the issues we were discussing at the Cabinet subcommittee that I referred to and that I chaired earlier uh, this week. So the Scottish Government is focused on making sure uh, that we take the action necessary. Uh, the member is right to point out that countries like ours that have done the most to cause climate change and have benefited from emissions uh, down the, the generations uh, now have a particular responsibility to take action to combat uh, climate change. Uh, and that undoubtedly includes uh, the transition away from fossil fuels uh, to clean renewable sources of energy. And that is important for Scotland. Uh, it's important for Scotland in the context of the climate emergency, but of course the North Sea is a declining uh, basin, so it is important uh, for other reasons as well. But it's also important that that transition is a just one, which which is why our work on just transition is so important as well. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, what a litany of utter complacency we've just heard in that question and response. In fact, the Scottish Government's response to the climate emergency shows seven out of 11 legal emissions targets missed, 11 out of 20 biodiversity targets missed, six out of eight key environmental milestones missed, and annual peatland restoration targets missed. So, after almost nine years of failing to get a grip on the climate emergency, does the First Minister believe that all, one or none of the candidates to succeed her will do a better job than she has? First Minister, recognised across the world as being a leader in tackling climate change, and rightly so. Um, and it's particularly notable that we have done that, achieved that leadership status, in the teeth of knee-jerk, opportunistic opposition from the Conservatives to almost every proposal we put forward. Their hypocrisy, hypocrisy is breathtaking. Because when we look at the proposals we've brought forward to try to encourage uh, people to travel to work in ways other than in their cars, or to recycle bottles and cans, for example, what do we get from the Tories? We get nothing but opposition. But we'll continue to tackle Let's climate hear the change First Minister. with or without the help of the Scottish Conservative Party. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We all want Scotland to play a leading role in tackling the global climate and nature emergencies. Does the First Minister agree with me that the global campaign to establish a law of ecocide, a mission started by the respected Polly Higgins, the late Polly Higgins, who was a barrister and environmental campaigner, is an important campaign and is rightly building momentum across Europe and around the world? Will she join me in encouraging people to support that campaign and will she encourage her government to continue to engage with me and the campaigners to explore how we can bring this into criminal law in Scotland. First Minister. Um, yes, uh, in principle I, I do and I would pay tribute to campaigners um, across many issues uh, in the fight against climate change for the work that they do. I think it is important that we continue to increase our efforts uh, given the scale of the challenge that we face. So I will encourage uh, the government that comes after uh, mine to continue to do all of these things and to do them bravely um, and to do them despite the opposition that will come from the Scottish Conservatives and I would hope other parties across the chamber uh, will work uh, with the government to make sure that we are meeting these important obligations. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the UK Government's spring budget. 
First Minister. Well, while any limited additional money for the Scottish Government's budget is welcome, it does not go nearly far enough. Uh, we have repeatedly called on the UK Government to deploy its full range of powers to support people, the public sector and businesses through the cost of living crisis. Uh, and the Chancellor's budget yesterday was, disappointingly, uh, another missed opportunity to do that. The decisions announced yesterday uh, mean that this Government will continue to have a constrained ability to support vital services and provide fair pay rises. Uh, this Government is doing everything it can within its limited powers to ensure people receive the help needed, but the UK could have done far more to ease the burden affecting so many. And of course, that demonstrates yet again why Scotland does need the full powers of independence. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that reply. The Office for Budget Responsibility says UK household disposable income will fall by 5.7 per cent this year and next, the largest two-year fall since records began in 1957. Does the First Minister agree that this damp squib of a budget goes nowhere near addressing the true scale of the cost of living crisis, was a missed opportunity to support households struggling to meet eye-watering energy costs, rising again as the Chancellor ends the £67 monthly payment many households have relied on since October, provides no help to businesses struggling with acute skills and labour shortages, and that an independent, energy-rich Scotland would invest in carbon capture, ignored by the UK for a decade, reform broken energy markets and cut costs for households and businesses alike. First Minister. Um, I absolutely agree uh, with Kenny Gibson. Uh, firstly, he's right uh, to point to the economic uh, forecast, but uh, looks, let's look at what the experts had to say yesterday. The IFS, uh, the OBR, may be more positive about inflation in the economy, but it's still projecting that 2022 and 2023 will see the biggest ever fall in living standards or the Resolution Foundation, the economic outlook is better than previously feared, but it's still very bad. This is on course to be the worst parliament on record for living standards by a country mile. That's the Conservative responsibility and the Conservative record. Uh, Kenny Gibson also raised carbon capture, and can I say how deeply uh, disappointed uh, this government was yesterday that we had no further clarity on a timeline for the deployment of the Scottish cluster. Uh, we were expecting further clarity. We we had been given assurances, I had been given assurances directly by the Prime Minister that further clarity would be forthcoming, so it's doubly disappointing that we didn't get that yesterday. The Deputy First Minister will be writing to the UK Government setting out that disappointment and frustration and of course we'll make sure that letter is published. Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday the Chancellor announced the introduction of 30 hours of free childcare from nine months old. This has the potential to truly transform childcare by supporting parents and giving our children the best possible start in life. I have been contacted by mums across Scotland who think this is a wonderful policy. Does the First Minister agree with me that the Scottish Government should match this major commitment by extending its current childcare policy? First, well, of course, if the Scottish Government was to match the UK Government uh, on early years education and childcare, we'd have to reduce the provision yeah. Yeah. that is currently available yeah, that's, in that Scotland. The case. Because we Thank you. are already way ahead of anything yep. uh, the UK Government provides because of the doubling under this Government of early years education and childcare uh, for three and four year olds uh, and eligible two year olds. Of course, uh, we want to go further and we're clear about this at the last election uh, for younger children. Uh, but we want to uh, make sure that an important principle in our provision is also respected uh, about the universal approach because what was announced yesterday uh, by the Chancellor is very very limited. Uh, and, and to give an indication of how limited, the consequentials uh, in the forthcoming financial year from that commitment to the Scottish Government amount to just around £20 million. Yeah. That tells its own story about how, despite the spin, what the UK Government is proposing here is very, very limited. Yeah. Our ambition remains very much higher. Myrtle Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Swimming pools across Scotland are currently facing closure, including the leisure pool in Perth, where I live. Yesterday, in the budget statement, the Chancellor announced a £63 million fund for swimming pools in England. Will the Scottish Government use the Barnet consequentials that will arise from that extra money to support swimming pools here in Scotland, currently facing closure? 
Yep. First Minister. No, I'm not sure, Presiding Officer, whether Myrtle Fraser has ever been invited uh, to use the Prime Minister's personal swimming pool. Uh, but if he hasn't, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, that that invitation will be forthcoming. Um, on, the, on the issue of swimming pools, local sport and leisure facilities include... Doug, Douglas Ross seems a bit sensitive about the Prime Minister's yes, private swimming pool. Maybe he hasn't had an invitation either. Local sport... <laughs> Thank you all. I don't find I, I'm perhaps amused by the, the leader of the opposition rather than the issue presiding officer. Uh, local sport and leisure facilities, including swimming pools, are vital in supporting uh, both the physical and mental health of people across uh, the country. Of course, energy costs have been a very significant issue facing many sports facilities, particularly swimming pools over recent times. Uh, we will continue to support uh, local councils with the best possible financial settlements. And in terms of the use of consequentials, of course, that will be a matter uh, for the incoming First Minister and his or her cabinet. Question number five, Craig Hoy. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government has made any assessment of the effect that long a &E waiting times has on patient mortality. First Minister. Well, I think everyone accepts uh, that there is a link between long waits and increased risk of harm. Uh, that is why we remain committed to delivering improved a &E performance. Uh, in 2018 in NHS England, the Emergency Medicine Getting It Right First Time programme carried out an analysis of the relationship between time spent in emergency departments and patient harm. That analysis uh, proved association but not causation. Uh, we considered uh, that analysis very closely and we will continue to monitor research and analysis into the relationship between time spent in emergency departments and patient harm. But of course we remain focused uh, on ensuring we reduce weights in accident and emergency. First Minister, new figures have revealed that an estimated 765 people died due to dangerously long a &E waiting times last year. That means 64 patients dying needlessly, leaving behind 64 grieving families each and every month under this SNP government. The First Minister has less than two weeks left in the job, so she has no need to uh, deflect, dissemble or distract attention by shifting the blame. Yeah. So will she now, therefore, take this opportunity to apologise to the families of those patients who died and say sorry for her government's appalling legacy on the Scottish NHS? First Minister. Well, firstly, uh, we accept and everybody should accept that long waits uh, lead to poorer outcomes. Uh, that is why we focus on reducing a &E waiting times uh, and it's why we have worked so hard uh, to ensure that we continue to have the best performing accident and emergency uh, waiting time department, uh, departments anywhere in the UK. Uh, let's put some context on this, of course. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine uh, has made estimates about Scotland, uh, but it is also estimated that in 2022 uh, there uh, were over uh, 23,000 uh, excess deaths in A&E uh, linked to long waits uh, in England. That's proportionately three times higher than the estimate for uh, Scotland. Uh, that that sorry, excuse me, members, First Minister, but sorry, it is can I ask that members do not continue to contribute while people are asking questions or responding to them? Thank you. That is why it is vital that we continue to reduce weights uh, and long weights in particular in A&E. And in recent weeks, uh, not only have we been seeing an improvement in accident and emergency waiting times, but we've seen a reduction in the longest weights, those waiting over eight hours and 12 hours. And we will remain focused uh, on securing these improvements. Paul O'Kane. Thank you, Presiding Officer. These are people who have died that we are talking about. In the final quarter of 2022, excess deaths in Scotland rose by almost 10% above the five-year average, meaning that an additional 1,433 people died than would have been expected based on historical trends. Each death a tragedy, but they're not a statistical coincidence. They are evidence of widening health inequalities, the normalisation of 12 hours waiting in A&E, and a failure to increase cancer diagnosis rates. This is the heartbreaking reality of Hamza Yusuf's disaster record as health secretary and it will be the legacy of this first minister so i'd ask her why has she allowed the nhs to decline into such a state of perpetual crisis and does she agree with clinicians staff patients and indeed her finance secretary kate forbes that hamza yusuf shouldn't be anywhere near running our health service first minister 
if, every one of these numbers is a human being and it's important that it is uh, treated in that way, which is why when the member uh, goes on to politicise in the way he has done, I think he kind of undermines his own argument in that. The comparisons are important only because if we listen to questions like that, the suggestion is that the situation in our National Health Service in Scotland is somehow unique and that it is all down to whoever the Health Secretary is or the fact that we have an SNP government. The reason I make these comparisons is for context. Health services everywhere are dealing with these challenges. Uh, the biggest challenge, of course, in recent years being a global pandemic that has caused many of these pressures. But that is why it is so important uh, that we are a government that has supported and continues to support record investment, record numbers of people working in our National Health Service. We're now seeing improvements in waiting times. We want to see these improvements go further and faster, but we've seen a reduction in those waiting for the longest periods of time in accident and emergency departments. So this is the hard work uh, of government, and this government, under new leadership in coming weeks, uh, albeit, but this government will remain focused on doing the hard work uh, and repaying the trust that the people of Scotland have placed in us. Question number six, Colin McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide police with access to all correspondence, transcripts, meeting notes and other communications with ministers, its officials, with the Scottish Prison Service to assist with the investigation regarding the Alan Marshall case. First Minister. Well, firstly, Presiding Officer, my thoughts and condolences, of course, remain with the family <coughs> of Alan Marshall. Uh, the former Justice Secretary uh, met, met with him personally following the fatal accident inquiry determination. There is, of course, now a live police investigation underway, so it would be inappropriate for me or anyone else in the Scottish Government to comment on that investigation. But I, I will, of course, confirm that the Scottish Government will cooperate fully with any investigation uh, undertaken by Police Scotland. Pauline McNeill. Since I first read of the death of Alan Marshall, who died in March 2015 as a result of injuries sustained four days earlier whilst being held in remand at HMP Edinburgh, I did vow to do all I can for Alan's family. First Minister will know that the CCTV footage from the prison showed that Alan was dragged naked by the feet faced in along a corridor by 13 prison officers. The officers involved were given immunity from prosecution in the eight long years since his death. Alan's family have been waiting for the answers. Press reports indicate that some of the prison officers branded, were branded consistently dishonest at the inquiry but were able to retire on full pensions without any stain on their service. The independent review into the response to deaths in prison custody that was discussed recently in this Parliament recommended that families should have unfettered access to information about a death in custody. Now, I wonder if the First Minister agrees that this is a shocking episode in Scottish justice and that, of course, it's a matter for the Lord Advocate. I fully appreciate that. But does the First Minister agree with me that future Lord Advocates need to look at the outcome of this case and the mistakes in this case before granting immunity in the future? And I call on the Government, I think they have said they'll do this, to implement in full the recommendations of the independent review into deaths in custody. First Minister. Can I... I mean, I'll, I'll point back to the comment I made earlier on. There is a live police investigation, so it is uh, appropriate that I am uh, careful in what I say uh, in order that nothing I, I say could possibly prejudice any ongoing investigation. But I do absolutely understand uh, the sentiment expressed. I, I watched the full CCTV uh, coverage. Uh, my heart goes out uh, to the family of Alan Marshall, and I absolutely uh, understand the concern that was uh, raised by that. Uh, decisions around prosecution or immunity from prosecution are rightly in, and properly in our democracy for independent prosecutors, and it would be wrong uh, for me as a politician to seek to second uh, guess that. Uh, but there is now, of course, an investigation uh, underway. Um, in relation to the wider point, and I think it is a point very uh, well made, the independent review of deaths in custody uh, was important and it is now uh, vital uh, that that is taken forward. The Scottish Government is making progress on recommendations, including the proposal uh, for an independent investigation into every death in custody. So, in answer uh, to the question Pauline McNeill asked, uh, should lessons be learned from this case to inform future decisions? Of course, 
uh, that is the case. But that must be uh, done in the proper way and in line with due process. Uh, but I absolutely understand the concerns that have been raised in association with this case, and I hope the processes under we will help uh, to give further, if not comfort, uh, then some degree of assurance um, and in time consolation uh, to Alan Marshall's family. Okay. Um, we move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Graham Simpson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will recall, will recall that in October last year, I asked her to consider introducing baby loss certificates for parents who have experienced a pregnancy or baby loss prior to 24 weeks. And this week, she announced that this will happen this summer, uh, along with the introduction of a memorial book. And of course, that's been welcomed by parents and charities, including Baby Loss Retreat, whose shop I opened in Airdrie. So I want to thank the First Minister uh, and ask if she can be more specific about when it will happen uh, and what the process will be for getting a certificate. First Minister. Uh, this initiative will begin uh, this summer. Um, I will ask uh, that further information is provided near the time about the specific date uh, for that, and I will ask that some information is shared with MSPs about the particular process. Some detail of that was uh, shared earlier this week when we announced uh, the initiative. For example, there will be no need for medical evidence uh, for people uh, who apply uh, for uh, either an entry in the memorial book or a certificate, um, and that is important. This should be as easy a process as possible. Uh, for bereaved parents. Um, I think this is a really important step forward. I won't uh, again go into detail. People are aware of it. This is something uh, that I think is absolutely the right thing to do for the country. It's something uh, that is important to me personally, um, and I hope it does bring uh, some comfort and consolation uh, to those uh, who lose uh, babies uh, before 24 weeks uh, in the future, but also uh, to some who have suffered that loss in the past. And I know from many of the comments that have been made in response to the announcement this week uh, that that is the case. But I will ensure uh, that further information is shared and that as that develops uh, over the period until this initiative is launched, uh, we will continue to share as much as possible. Fulton McGregor. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister may be aware of a recent decision taken by North Lanarkshire Council to downgrade early years workers, predominantly women, from Grade 9 to Grade 7, a significant drop in income of up to £10,000 in some cases. I have been contacted by many of these workers, terrified of the impact these changes will have, especially in the grip of a cost of living crisis. They also feel let down and undervalued. Does the First Minister agree with me that early years workers are an absolute cornerstone of our education system? And can she outline the Scottish Government's ongoing commitment to this sector? And will she join me and my North Lanarkshire constituency MSP colleagues in calling for Labour-controlled North Lanarkshire to reverse this decision and sit down with workers and unions to find a solution? First Minister. I very much agree with Fulton McGregor that early learning and childcare workers are a, a cornerstone of our education system. Indeed, we could not have delivered the landmark expansion to 1,140 hours of funded uh, early learning and childcare without them. Uh, the Scottish Government fully funds councils to deliver 1,140 hours of high quality early learning and childcare to all eligible children with around a billion pounds of investment each year. It is of course for councils to make decisions about funding and workforce to meet their statutory duties on uh, provision in their area. Uh, I do appreciate that the proposed changes in North Lanarkshire are causing real concerns for early learning and childcare staff. I understand that the Council is working with staff and trade unions to find solutions for those affected by the proposed changes, uh, but I would certainly encourage uh, the Councils uh, and all parties to continue to work together to identify a positive way forward. Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. The, the First Minister promised a new National Treatment Centre for Cumbernauld in 2021. That was supposed to treat its first patient in 2026. Uh, FOI requests have said that that will now not happen until 2028 at the very earliest, and even that is, and I quote, is challenging. So can the First Minister say when our government will deliver on the promise made back in 2021 
and start seeing my constituents in come and all who are currently languishing on NHS waiting lists. First Minister. Well, we continue to keep the whole programme under review to make sure that we deliver all of these new centres as quickly as possible. Of course, the, the context is very challenging uh, with high inflation leading to higher construction costs. Uh, but there are four national treatment centres uh, opening in the coming year. I hope that I may get the opportunity to open one before uh, leaving office and they will provide significant uh, additional surgeries and procedures. These four new centres in NHS 5, NHS Forth Valley, NHS Highland and and the second phase of the Golden Jubilee are going to make a significant contribution to the NHS recovery plan and uh, the other centres, as I say, we keep under review to ensure that they are delivered as quickly as possible, despite the challenging circumstances we face. Co Cap Stewart. Thank you. The UN Refugee Agency has condemned it. International charities are horrified by it, and the EU Commission is scathing of it. And it may indeed be in violation of continental-wide European Convention on Human Rights. Does the First Minister agree that the UK Government's illegal migration bill has no place in an open and internationalist Scotland that we in this Parliament are seeking to build? First Minister. Uh, yes, I do agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, this Scottish Government, uh, like many other people, has condemned what is a cruel and inhumane bill, and we continue to urge the UK Government to scrap it. It is beyond me how Douglas Ross could have voted for that bill in the House of Commons earlier this week. I think it is incumbent on all of us to demonstrate respect for international law, human rights and social justice in offering protection uh, with humane, fair and compassionate refugee and asylum policies. And I certainly hope and expect that is exactly what an independent Scotland uh, would be able to do. You know, during this week, uh, this Scottish Government extended funding for a Women in Conflict uh, Fellowship. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the UK Government pressed forward with a bill that would see the rights of women uh, subject to trafficking and sexual exploitation taken away uh, and children subject to detention. No one, no one with any moral conscience should support legislation uh, that, uh, in line with international law, against international law, removes offering a place of safety to desperate people fleeing conflict and persecution. Yeah. Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I know from your own contributions you will be aware that this week is Sign Language Week. The First Minister will be as relieved as I am. I'll finish the rest of the question in English. Um, uh, thank you to our wonderful parliamentary interpreters. Uh, I wonder if the First Minister would join me in raising awareness of British Sign Language, acknowledging its distinctness as a language in its own right, both here in Scotland and right across the UK, sharing the same equal status as Welsh and Scots Gaelic, for example. This year's Sign Language Week theme is protecting BSL. So will the First Minister and the whole Parliament join me in helping to promote, to protect and educate people about BSL, and in doing so encourage more people to start learning this beautiful, unique and visual language so we can truly protect and protect and preserve BSL for many future uh, generations to come and in doing so also join me in thanking the many interpreters in this parliament who help us. First Minister. I do agree and uh, let me take the opportunity uh, to echo those sentiments. Uh, entirely. Uh, BSL is a distinctive uh, language in, in its own right. It is a beautiful language and visually uh, distinctive, uh, as the member has said. And I'm proud uh, that this parliament uh, has recognised the status of it, and uh, that is absolutely uh, appropriate. Um, I think uh, we could all do more to raise awareness of it. Uh, perhaps we could all do more to learn uh, the language and perhaps now that I might have a bit more time. That's a, a commitment I'm prepared uh, to make uh, here uh, today. Uh, can I uh, just take the opportunity in agreeing with everything uh, that Jamie Green uh, has said uh, to thank uh, some BSL interpreters uh, without whom I couldn't have done my job uh, over 
uh, the past few years. Uh, everybody will recall during the, the COVID uh, briefings, the BSL interpreters uh, that were there present with me every single day. Uh, they were crucial in making sure that we were able to communicate properly and fully the public health messages uh, that were so essential to keeping the country safe during that time. So that is just one example of the value of BSL. I want to thank them for that, uh, for all uh, users of the language and interpreters of the language, and let us uh, all make a resolution that we will do more uh, to raise awareness of it uh, for the interests of the inclusive country that I think all of us